Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, An Easy Approach to Wound Cleaning and Debridement, the Role of Non-Medicated Antimicrobial Dressings in Antimicrobial Stewardship. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few details so you know how to participate in today's event. You can submit questions to Rose by typing them into the question panel found by clicking on the Q&A icon along the bottom of the menu. You may submit your questions at any time. We will collect them and address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, you will receive a survey and we would appreciate receiving your feedback. But before I introduce Rose, uh, I just would like to introduce an SID initiative that's called Wounds Warriors. This is an initiative that we just launched a couple of weeks ago and um, it's a global campaign by SID to educate and support health professionals in an effort to fight antimicrobial resistance and lead to better outcomes for patients. And this information on this slide is just about Wounds Warriors as they have um, a, uh, identified an antimicrobial resistance as one of the world's most pressing drug resistant trends and launched a global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. If you would like to have this kit that you see on the slide in front of you, the website is down below at uh, www.woundswarriors.ca and you will receive some information within the kit and a free sample of Sorbact. Now I would like to introduce Rose. Rose is a nurse practitioner with her degree in microbiology. She works at Scarborough Hospital and has extensive experience speaking on a variety of different subjects. I have heard her speak many times myself and I know that you are really going to enjoy this presentation tonight. Without further ado, here's Rose Reisman. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to share my experience with uh, hydrophobic dressing and also some uh, recent literature which I reviewed. And uh, thank you, ACT, for the opportunity to present. Uh, this presentation is sponsored by ACT. Uh, however, I will express my own views because I cannot do otherwise. Uh, and I will try to stay uh, within the proper limits of expressing my views. So hopefully today we will talk about why antimicrobial resistance develops and how it affects the world. Uh, what is antimicrobial stewardship? We will approach, uh, uh, we will see the approach to antimicrobial treatment in the wound care. And uh, we will discuss some unique uh, properties of hydrophobic antimicrobial wound dressing. We will talk about mechanical debridement tool by ACT. Uh, we will do a very, very quick overview of cellular mechanism of wound chronicity that require debridement, why to debride, and we will review case studies. And as I know, most of the people like the case studies, so if I see that I'm running out of time, I'll rush to the case studies. So we're going to discuss today a little creature too small to be seen by the naked eye as it was before 1665 when Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, uh, he is credited with the discovery of bacteria in uh, 1676. And then uh, Mr. Robert Hook uh, was uh, the other one who is uh, noted. We will look to the historical overview of the antimicrobial developments. And we will look a little bit in our creatures bacterium. And what are the features which make bacteria so dangerous to us? Uh, we will talk about microbes and microorganism in a whole. And uh, I assume that you're very well uh, familiar with the uh, wound uh, infection continuum. Uh, the only thing which I want to draw your attention is that the 2016 uh, paper uh, made some recommendations that critical colonization, which was usually placed here, should be removed from the wound infection continuum due to the lack of a specific definition of unanimous understanding of them. 
and the term microbes should be replaced should re re replace bacteria because in the wound infection continuum, given the understanding that organisms other than bacteria, for example, fungi or viruses, are common causative of wound infection, and the presence of biofilm, which was not uh, uh, there before, should be added to the wound infection continuum, and we will talk about all those. So. Uh, we need to make sure that when we have a wound, we know that it's contaminated. There is some bacteria on the skin and it's normal. There is a colonization when there is a less than 10 uh, um, culture forming unit per gram. There is a localized infection and then a spreading infection, systemic infection and sepsis when intervention is required and systemic infection requires systemic antimicrobial therapy, while local infection can be limited to a local therapy and not necessarily always, like in colonization or contamination, you need antimicrobial interventions. So the biofilm, I'm sure you've heard about the biofilms because it was a trend topic starting 2010, I think, and even earlier if you were into the into the uh, infection world. And the notion that the, from free floating bacteria, microbes attach to the surface and to each other, they form a cell proliferation via quorum sensing. And we will talk a little bit more today about quorum sensing and why it's important. And then they grow into maturation and they start to release and disperse biofilm fragments to bring more and more. So here you can see a wound contamination colonization continuum and you can still see chronic colonization here because the paper by Dr. Schulz was from 2005 and the papers from the wound infection and clinical practice is from 2016. Now we all know that biofilm cannot be directly visualized in the wound. And the experienced clinician may suspect biofilm is present, but nobody can see it with naked eye. And we judge that there is a biofilm also by notion that most of the chronic wounds, according to research, almost 80% have them, and that the failure of appropriate antibiotic treatment and proper wound healing is failing. So uh, we see a low level erythema, low level chronic inflammation, poor granulation of friable hypergranulation and secondary sign of infection will signal us that there is something wrong with the wound and probably biofilm is present. And again, the primary determinants of a pathological process through which presence of bacteria and other microorganisms result in the wound infection and harmful, harmful effects on an individual is very dependent on the pathogen and also the individual himself. And we've just evidenced the beautiful COVID show, which we had for the past, I would say, even year and a half. And we've seen some people are dying from COVID and some people even don't know they had it and we find out that they have it. So virulence is very important, but also the host pathogen interaction is very, very important. And we need to remember it when we are making our choices. So again, points for practice from the uh, infection consensus uh, paper. The effectiveness of the whole defense system together with the quantity and virulence of microbes influence the development of wound infection. So now I have a question to you. Which of the following events can lead to the acquired antibiotic resistance in bacteria? So, 64% of you say that acquired antibiotic resistance can be from formation of the biofilm. And uh, 47 uh, believes that there is a presence of antibiotic. So let's see what the science say about it. 
forms of antimicrobial resistance uh, come uh, from three forms. The first one is known as transient resistance or tolerance. And actually transient resistance or, or tolerance does not involve a change in the genetic uh, uh, complement of the organism, but rather a change in the expression of established genes. So um, it can be influenced by environment conditions. And a good example here is bacterium that is susceptible to antibiotics when it's free living. However, when it forms a biofilm, it displays resistance to the same antibiotic. One of the reasons for this is that in the biofilm, as we've talked, the metabolic rate of the microorganism is slowed down. And if the organisms become free living again, it would show susceptibility to antibiotics again. So biofilm, antibiotics or antiseptics will not cause acquired antibiotics resistance. The second form of antimicrobial resistance is known as innate or intrinsic resistance. Here, there is no recent change in the genetic component of the organism, but due to its structural function, it is inherently resistant to antibiotics. Uh, due to outer membrane on the surface of the cell wall, it becomes impossible for many antibiotics to penetrate the layer and uh, reach the interior of the cell. And this makes the microorganism resistant. And the third form on the antimicrobial resistance is known as acquired resistance. This is the one which I was asking about. And here there is a genetic change. So in the acquired resistance, there is a genetic change. And this genetic change uh, happened when bacteria can transfer genetic element known as a plasmids from one cell to another. And this can carry resistant genes. Once an organism acquires these genes, it can continue transferring them to surrounding organisms and even to the different species. Until that resistance strain is exposed to the antibiotics, its resistance may not be apparent. Antibiotics tend to work by targeting a specific site in the cell. So, like it was shown recently by Helen Loden in her presentation, it's unsafe sex when the bacteria can exchange the genes, and sometimes it's happened in between the species. So five main resistant mechanisms displayed by bacteria uh, to evade, to throw away antibiotics is um, enzymatic degradation of antibiotic, structural changes in the target site that prevent binding of the antibiotics, acquisition of alternate enzymes or pathways that avoid the target site of the antibiotics, reduced permeability of the cell envelope to prevent ingress of the antibiotics, and acquisition of efflux pump. And there, this five way can overcome the effect of an antibiotic and become resistant. So there are genetic causes of AMR, like we've talked about. So mutational resistance caused by genetics in the organism that affects the activity of the drug, horizontal genes uh, transfer, which was named unsafe sex, drug modification or destruction, bacteria either inactivate or destroy uh, the antibiotics, efflux mechanism, permeability barrier, and altered targeted site. Now, in addition to bacteria itself, human causes of antimicrobial resistance is inappropriate or overuse of antibiotics. And we see it a lot of time when the patient come and ask, can you please prescribe me antibiotics because I feel so good after it. Inadequate infection diagnosis. And a lot of us always ponder to swab or not to swab. Right? This is always happens. And critically ill patients in the hospital are more susceptible to infection and thus often require antimicrobial and extensive use of antimicrobial and close contact among sick patients create a fertile environment for spread of antimicrobial resistance. Poor hygiene and sanitation and the poor lack to access of clean water is also one of the human causes of antimicrobial resistance. Now, I want to quickly uh, draw your attention to confusion in the terms which are used. So antimicrobial means sub substance that act directly on the microbe 
in a way that will either kill the organism or significantly hinder development of a new colony. The term incorporates disinfectants, antiseptics, and antibiotics. So both bactericidal and bacteriostatic can be antimicrobial. And then we have antibiotics, antifungal, Antisepsis, it's a removal of the bioburden from living tissue. Antiseptic is non-selective agents that are applied topically in order to inhibit multiplication of heal microorganisms. And aseptic technique is a wound management technique that minimizes introduction of new pathogen. Now, International Wound Infection Institute, Wound Infection and Clinical Practice, principles of best practice are available to download. I used a lot of their graphics. It's very, very uh, useful paper, which you can download easily. Now, again, if we're depicting it, anti-infectives can be antibiotics, biocides, which is disinfectants and antiseptics, anti-infective biologics, and also wound dressings that physically affect uh, the bacteria. And we will talk about those today. Antimicrobial agents have been in use for a long time. Ancient civilization used agents such as honey and herbs, and I love honey still, and I use herbs now. In the late 800s, there was an era of discoveries, and you can see a lot of uh, antimicrobials was developed there, which culminated by development of the first antibiotics um, but holistic approach to individuals with or at risk for active wound infections remained essential to best practice and prevention, identification, and management of wound infection. And this is of particular importance in the context of increasing antibiotic resistance. So we speak about antimicrobial stewardship today. And I always say, oh, there is some infection. I was always saying, oh, there is some infection in the wound. Let's slap the antimicrobial dressing just in case. People are predisposed to infection. Let's slap it just in case. And antimicrobial stewardship is a solution to reducing and preventing further antimicrobial resistance. And it is a multimodal approach, also known as, as a stewardship. It's a national and international organization responsibility. It's a public responsibility, and it's a clinician responsibility. And all of us are responsible to save the world. And truly, till I really started to work on this presentation, I was not aware of the extent, even though I've heard it here and there, and yes, it's important, and we actually have antimicrobial stewardship uh, program in the hospital, and I even have some tools and maybe even published some articles about how important it is. I was not aware how important it is. So education actually is very important. And when we're looking at the antibiotic discovery by Sir Fleming in 1928, it's interesting that we also find resistance. So for example, penicillin, penicillin resistant, tetracyclines, tetracycline resistance. You can see fluoroquinolones, for fluoroquinolones resistance. And for the past 30 years, since a new class of antibiotics uh, introduced, there was no new classes because everything which we find is there is resistance. So question to you, microbes resistant to antibiotics started to form during the 1940. Do you think it's true or false? So 72% of the people think it's true. Actually, it's not so true because antibiotic resistance was first detected in 1940s, but it had existed for thousands of years. Antibiotics resistance rate have been isolated from environments that have not been exposed to human activity for thousands of years. They have been isolated for permafrost from caves and the Egyptian mummies. You remember when I was talking about uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, by bacteria, they can transfer those uh, but it still uh, can uh, be not evident. And uh, actually, when I talked about how bacteria uh, acquire antimicrobial resistance, it can be spontaneous mutation. And when they multiply a lot, they mutate. Look at our COVID. There is new and new strains, which more and more variable without any antimicrobials. 
And again, this is another uh, line when it shows we develop different antibiotics and then there is a resistance developed the next year. Another question states, which of the following factors have contributed to the emergence of microbial uh, strands with antimicrobial resistance? What do you think cause antimicrobial resistance? Antibiotic overuse in humans, antibiotics overuse in animals being produced for food, ineffective sanitation measures, inadequate infection control measures, using non-lethal doses of antibiotic therapeutically, oh my God, and all of the above. So what do we say? All of the above. And the antibiotic use of human. Yes, I think you all are right, all of the above. And this is very important because all of the above cause the antimicrobial resistance. One Health refers to de designing and implementing programs, policies, legislations, and research in a way that enable multiple sectors and stakeholder engage in the human, terrestrial, aquatic, plant, food, and feed activities. So from everywhere, antimicrobial resistance develops. Now, okay, antimicrobial resistance. What, why it's important? Um, we need to develop scenarios where countries can cope with these measures and invest more towards the development of new medicine and diagnostic techniques. Why? Because the mortality of the antimicrobial resistance it's huge and it's growing. One very interesting report was published in 2014 and it was part of the series of five reports which were developed by Lord O'Neill in the United Kingdom. The sixth report was a summary of the five report and they used computer modeling to predict the impact of antimicrobial resistor in the future. Certain assumptions were made and the people looked at the number of antimicrobial infections that would lead to the death. And they estimated that 700,000 people die of infection every year. But by the year 2050, which is only a generation away, they calculated the annual death rate due to the antimicrobial resistance would rise to 10 million individuals per annum. 10 million individuals per annum. And you can see by 2050 in different countries, how many deaths per 10,000 population? We will see. So deaths will be there and it's, it's affecting us. Continued emergence of antimicrobial resistance is likely to impact the global economy with one human generation. Is it true or false? So we say that the deaths will rise, but do you think it will going to impact our economical situation. So what do you think? True. You're absolutely right. It's absolutely true. With the amount of deaths, it would be a severe impact on the economy. And that was estimated to be a loss of 100 trillion. Many people thought that this was an overestimation. However, in 2017, the World Bank did an analysis of impact of drug resistance on our economic future. They come up with the two scenarios. The first was that if we had a low impact due to antimicrobial resistance, uh, they determined that there will be decrease of the gross domestic product by uh, between 2000 to 2030 by 1.1%. And an annual shortfall will be one trillion. The second scenario was that if we had a high impact and the estimated loss of 3.8% in gross domestic product and annual short of 3.4 trillion, and it's by 2030, which is pretty close. We all will be probably living during this time. The two calculations really bring to our attention the adverse impact of antimicrobial resistance may have on future generation. Recently, an intra-agency coordinator group has been formed in the United Nations, and their message emphasizes that the 
global crisis due to antimicrobial resistance is really significant. And World Health Organization uh, also declared a plan which prevention come first. And we need to take an urgent action and we need to facilitate and design and implement policies and training and education should be part of it. And a number of different papers now published about antimicrobial stewardship in, in wound care and in general. But since we're talking about wound care, let's talk about wound care. It's a paper by Lipsky 2016 and the co-authors stated that interprofessional effort across the continuum of a patient care that involves the timely and optimal selection of antimicrobial agents and their doses and duration should be implemented. And aim is to achieve the best clinical outcome with minimal toxicity and the environment. So uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs generally focus on the uh, following key strategies. They need to increase effort toward effective infection control methods and hand hygiene practice. They need to create a consistent knowledge base and education opportunities for clinicians of the effective use of antimicrobial. They need to prescribe the appropriate antimicrobial tre treatment when therapy is indicated, to prescribe uh, antimicrobial duration at an op op optimal dose, and to use an agent with the lowest risk. And it's a, you see, education is the second circle and then we need to change traditional local practices just in case. Let's put silver just in case, because when there will be a case, silver will be not active. So let's not do it just in case. Accurate assessment of clinical signs and symptoms of infection, early identification. So we don't need to give you systemic antibiotics. We can do a local antiseptics or antibiotics. Minimize use of unnecessary broad spectrum antibiotics. Use the dressings of physical mode of action, antiseptics and uh, antimicrobial dressing and topical agents for your wound care, and responsibilities on the patients as well. It's very hard sometimes uh, to withstand the pressure of the patient giving me antibiotics. It takes a long time to address it. So there is a papers for antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, by World Union and Wound Healing Societies. And uh, it has a lot of useful information with stressing that over-reliance on antimicrobials has led to a worrying increase in antibiotic resistance bacteria. Now, when we're looking at the wound continuum and the biofilm formation and interpretation, people caring for patients with a risk or at risk wounds need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of infection. It's very important. And the patient also should be educated and have an expectation. So practice point from remember from the con uh, um, consensus update, do not undertake microbiological analysis of wound spicement in the absence of appropriate indication. So wound continuum in the contamination and colonization phase, you have a clinical signs and symptoms, don't take it if you don't need it, unless there is a deterioration. So when you, when you do investigation, establish, you do it for establishing specific pathogen strands in the wound. You need to confirm the microbes and the sensitivity. You need to identify possible complication and guide management strategies. So which wounds are you going to uh, subtract to microbiological analysis. It will be acute wounds with the classic signs and symptoms of infection. It will be chronic wounds which are deteriorating. It will be infected wounds that have failed to respond to antimicrobial intervention. Sometimes it was given generic and you want to know exactly what happened. It will be in compliance with surveillance protocol and wound where the presence of certain species, for example, a mosaic contact or something like this. So we all know definition of chronic wounds. We know how they look. And they usually stuck in an inflammatory phase. But remember, there can be inflammation without infections. And there are tests which are showing inflammation available on the market. 
or you can use your clinical signs of infection. There is a different devices, fluorescence device, which can show you if there is a bacteria. And obviously you're going to use your clinical judgment. And devitalized tissue can be removed physically. And now swab or not to swab and what kind of swab you want to use. So the literature shows that levine uh, swab is what you want to do, levine technique or tissue culture. So I'm lucky I can just take the curette and take some tissue and culture it. And I usually use my uh, moleculite to check where is the bacteria. So I'm doing it in the proper place. But uh, this is what literature say. We all know time and dime and how necrotic tissue affect the wound environment. And uh, remember that sometimes necrotic tissue can be without bacteria and uh, cause the inflammation response. So we want to remove it. Uh, and uh, biofilm is present in 60%, some papers say 80% of the uh, chronic wounds. And mechanical debridement or sharp debridement, debridement can reduce the biofilm and biofilm does impede the healing. So not necessarily you need antibiotics. You can just take the tool and remove the weeds from your garden and from your wound. So you want to remove your slough, your pus and everything else. And then you will have a flowering epithelialized wound bed. So wound cleansing need to be part of every dressing change, not the wound blessing, the wound cleansing with the proper irrigation and uh, proper mechanical debridement, sharp debridement, larva therapy, autolytic debridement, any debridement which is available to you, you want to use depending on your knowledge, skill, judgment, and policies of your uh, place of work. So I want to draw your attention to mechanical debridement and one of the tools by ACT, which is uh, Kutimet Debriclen. What I usually use in my uh, practice, and especially if I have students or the uh, nurses helping uh, RN, RPN, or nursing students, we're using a gas, which is saturated in some antimicrobial cleansing solution. And we're using a lot of friction and shearing to remove the debris from the wound. I can also take the curette and curette it out when I think possible, but not everyone in their scope can take the curette. So for this reason, monofilament debridement with a mechanical wound cleansing is a very good opportunity. Now, some of you will say, oh, you know what? It's very nice, but it's very expensive. And this is, was my first response when I've seen this tool as well. But interestingly enough, National Institute of Health and Care Excellence uh, asked to uh, do the economical study and they compare different debriding agents and monofilament pad actually saved money. So you can see substantial amount of money was saved. And this is because debridement was, uh, found to accelerate wound healing, right? Because we constantly are removing uh, inflammation. So multi-step pro process in the treating the wound and debridement is very important part. And I'll show you a number of clinical studies, uh, my clinical uh, actually cases, which showed that uh, using the Putimet Debriclin effectively removed uh, uh, bacteria and the non-bacterial tissue. So the uh, Kutimed pad consists of number of layers, but the top layer have a very gentle abrasive uh, white monofilament loop and still gentle, but a little bit more abrasive blue monofilament loops and bacteria binds to them. And also mechanically, it's remove debris in the wound and in the surrounding tissues. In addition, it has a foam layer, which is absorbs the exudat and also have a very nice handle, which you can put in your hand and use it for debridement. So these uh, nice loops, uh, you can see under microscope. You cannot see it with the naked eye, but you can see it how they look before you clean the wound 
and how they look after the cleanse wound. This is the study in the lab showing that to the gas, after one time, there was almost nothing attached, but after when you use the debris claim, uh, it was attached right away. And you can see that uh, debris claim was way more effective in the removal on the, of the debris. Now, when we're looking at effective wound management, debridement is a very, very important step. But as we've told, we need to have a holistic approach. We need to optimize the host response. We need to address the diet, the condition. We need to make sure that if it's a venous leg ulcer, there is a compression. We need to reduce the microbial load. We need to promote environment and general measures. And then we need to reassess frequently to make sure that uh, our therapy is working. And we do use antimicrobials uh, in, the, uh, um, in the topical wound care. There is a number of agents which is antiseptics and is a broad spectrum which uh, reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance even though there is reports. But antimicrobial resistance to antiseptics is less explored. But to treat the antimicrobial resistance in woods, uh, it was recognized for a long time. And products that offer an alternative approach, such a physical mode of action, uh, need to be explored. And the rest, uh, a recent best practice statement on the wound management and antimicrobial stewardship identify uh, that uh, dressings that do not contain active pharmaceutical component and the step have physical mode of action to reduce bacterial load, offer an ideal option and the drive to promote antimicrobial stewardship. So now I'm going to try and share with you a video about, wait, I need safe and efficient infection management for my patients. Get to know the easy to apply, clinically proven Sorbact technology with its safe mode of action. Cutamed Sorbact can easily be used on all kinds of wounds as there are no known contraindications. It binds bacteria by a purely physical mode of action. Bacteria and or fungi are attracted to the sorbact mesh and are removed with every dressing change. Cutamed Sorbact has demonstrated proven effectiveness. Its clinical efficacy is proven worldwide, documented by a large amount of published clinical data. Furthermore, in a randomized comparative single site study, of 40 patients with leg ulcers, Cutamed Sorbact was more effective at reducing bio burden than Aquacel AG, showing an average bacterial load reduction of 73.1%. Cutamed Sorbact provides you with easy and safe infection management without known contraindications. The results speak for themselves. It's time to choose the easy, clinically proven, and safe Cutamed Sorbact for the management and prevention of infections. Cutamed Sorbact provides answers to today's clinical challenges in infection management and prevention. Uh, I want to stress here that it's bind bacterial toxin and leaves non-hydrophobic microorganism in the wound to stimulate healing. And we all know that our bacteria helps us in the gut and helps us on the wounds. Some bacteria are good, some bacteria are not so good, so we don't want to kill everyone. And it's nice if we can uh, find only pathogenic bacteria. It's very neat how bacteria bind to this dressing and uh, I call it a blanket party after I've heard somebody called it like this. It's very nice party blanket. And what uh, research was found that when the bacteria is binded to the dressing, it's also not multiplying in the dressing. So we reduce, and it was shown in the research that it's uh, effectively reduce uh, bacterial count in the wound by binding bacteria and it's not getting saturated. There was a number of studies with the saturation of the bacteria 
into the dressing and dressing is not getting saturated. There is a lot of studies showing that it's very effective in reducing of surgical site infection, for example, in cesarean section. Um, and uh, there is a very nice name of D-alkyl carbomyol chloride. This is how this dressing is called in the uh, proper language. And this is my case study of the 26 years old post-C-section lady. Uh, which has lupus and diabetes and was very compromised on day nine post C-section wound dehist and was treated with a different advanced wound therapies and uh, it, including the negative pressure therapy and there was no success. Uh, it brought her to hospitalization on day 22. And so on the assessment, the wound was 14 by four by four, pretty deep with five centimeter undermining and with 20% necrotic tissue. I used uh, DACC packing hydrophobic sorbact for the uh, negative pressure wound therapy interface. You can see a decrease of the necrotic tissue. There was decrease of smell. There was no pain on packing and the negative pressure was discontinued, patient discharged. And on day 30, she was closed. So you can see day 22, everything was open in spite of the therapy. Day 30, look, there is a beautiful closed wound. Lecomet Sorbact uh, was chosen by National Institute for Health and uh, Care Excellent in the uh, UK uh, for prevention. There is papers about antimicrobial stewardship and uh, uh, articles present evidence that support integration of it in the clinical practice. There is a number of patients with a pilonidal sinus with a surgical site infection and the uh, comparison with the silver dressing that it's an effective dressing. We need to remember that uh, you need to apply uh, this dressing in the moist environment because it works on the hydrophobicity. Now, remember, we were talking that approach to the wound care should be uh, uh, comprehensive and compression therapy is very important. And when I was doing the trials, I was lucky to, to get some uh, jobs compared to and a lot of patients found it superior to whatever they used and asked me if they can get more of it. Uh, because it was very comfortable to use. The versatile of the Sorbact is impressive. Uh, I use sometimes those round swabs to just clean the wound because it's lift up bacteria, remember? And we've done molecular kind of study to see and it indeed lifts it. There is a Sorbian Sorbact with a highly absorptive dressing. There is a packing. As you can see, I'll show you a video how easy to pack. And there is just an abdominal pad and Kutimed Sorbax Hydrogel, which moisturizes the wound. Now here is the wound, which is as it, uh, which is towards the groin, and then uh, uh, five centimeters toward the um, uh, toward the thigh. And it was very painful. I was packing it with silver. There was an uh, order, uh, the patient of diabetes, and the patient was screaming when I would need it to pack it. But when I used uh, the Kutimed, it was um, very easy going, and the patient was actually very happy. And here is another example of the patient with a narrow sinus. This patient had people thought that he had a pilonidal sinus, but uh, uh, it was actually um, hydroidonitis suppurativa with a lot of tunnels. You can see it's going to here. I will show it shortly. When you try to pack it with AMV gas, when you try to pack it with silver, a lot of time, as soon as you remove the Q-tip, the dressing will come out together with the Q-tip. The patient again was screaming from the pain. When I started to pack him with the sore back, it would easily slide How in. How does it feel? Any pain? Okay, so there was no screaming and he say a little bit and it was substantially better. So I, 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 I wanted to bring it to your attention because it's a huge improvement. So this is a cases of the negative pressure in the scrotal wound. This patient was uh, uh, hospitalized just before Christmas time. And we used the cutimet sorbac to the wall suction and then with the VAC therapy. And you see the wound closed, and again, the pain was reduced. This is an example of how not to use the Kutimet Sorbac. 
Actually, I don't know how, but it's very important to apply dressing properly because when you apply dressing improperly, the problems arise. So green part should be to the wound and it's actually very nicely indicated on the wound that the, this side up, but for some reason it was this side down and the wound deteriorated. Then I kind of provided education, not enough. You see it's still cut when it's not supposed to cut. And the wound become very nice and the patient was very happy. And now this is a clinical case of the diabetic foot ulcer, 78 years old uh, um, male, uh, eight months of different treatments modalities. You can see bones sticking here. Uh, we've used the PhD, we, P, PHMB, silver, uh, the weekly debridement and uh, amputation, and there was no success. And below near uh, amputation was discussed. And at that time I was uh, trialing the DCC Sorbac. We packed it with negative pressure and in the, the wound actually um, uh, closed in two months after eight months of nothing. And in six months, there was no reopening. Um, this is a case uh, with a vaginal tear, very traumatic vaginal birth and vaginal tear. The patient was crying with any dressings or any interventions to it. Uh, she agreed to try uh, the sorbact packing. And you can see that within four weeks, there was a huge improvement. There was no pain starting from the first dressing. This is a sacral ulcer, uh, uh, also sorbact use and uh, uh, with very good success. Now, this is a cutimed hydroactive. So this is a dressing which donates the moisture. This lady has psoriasis. So the wound was very painful and would not heal. So when we put the hydroactive dressing, it's, it's provided a proper moisture balance and wound actually closed in four weeks with again, quite before for a couple of months and in the seven months evaluation, the wound was closed. Now, sorbet keeps the wound nice and uh, prevent infection if applied correctly. And I really like this dressing. And I uh, also had a good success with the uh, with the Comprelan, uh, uh, Compre two dressing uh, because it was uh, not painful on the affected skin. Now I want to present a couple of cases. I have one minute left. Uh, I want to present a couple of cases uh, of the use um, of the Debriclin. So you can see before I cleaned with Debriclin. In the uh, this is the image of moleculite, which can show you the red area and cyan green area. This is a bacterial load, and this is after cleansing with the debris clean. Now I could take the curet theoretically and a curetizer it. It can be a little bit more traumatic, but if I have someone in the clinic who can help me with the dressings. I can give the debriclin and the, the therapy will be done. And here is in, actually we've talked that uh, digital photography can be a very helpful tool in the tracking wounds. And you can see uh, progress of the wound after uh, um, uh, debriclin was used for debridement of the wound and surrounding tissue. Again, you can see that bacteria binds with molecular to the dressing. And you can see the progress. You can see how the fluorescence is going away. Again, the progress of the wound. Uh, and you can see there is no progress uh, or slow progress. And we use the uh, Debriclin, the wound progressing well. And when the patient, and also this area of the wound was able to remove, you can see before and after. You see how beautifully skin is surrounding is cleansed. And I did the enlargement of the picture. You can see the wound progressing well after using of the uh, mechanical debridement. This gentleman, you can see the amount of reduction. It looks like there is nothing on the wound, but when I see with my um, moleculite, I can see where bacteria is concentrated. And after uh, mechanical debridement by cutimant, and the other thing you can, I gave it actually to the patient home so he could use it uh, in the shower or after the shower. And here is a short video.
how does it work? So you, you see, you're just making the circular movement and everything is disappearing from the wound. You can see it on the, uh, on the pad itself. And you remember we were talking that the gas was not as effective as the uh, debris clan, as a monofilament debrider. And uh, anyone can use it, including the patient or the nurse, you don't need to have, it's in your scope of practice. And the wound progressing very well because you both debride the wound and the surrounding tissue. So actually, um, again, you can see where is an infection and antimicrobial stewardship. You don't need any antimicrobial dressing here because there's no bacteria in. This is another very interesting case when uh, 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 Debra Klin uh, was able to remove the uh, tissue, hyperkeratotic tissue, and improve, uh, facilitate the healing uh, and reduce the pain uh, during the therapy. Now, this is a whole leg treatment with uh, uh, Debra Klin and uh, uh, Obviously, this patient in compression therapy to make sure that. Uh, so you see how nicely it's cleaned everything. You can curate it, but then you can bleed the patient very easily. Here, the skin is preserved nicely. Here, you can see the area where is bacteria is actually not so much on the, a little bit on the wood, but also in the ankle area, and we removed everything. So to conclude and leave time for the questions, it is very effective method. It works with different cleansing solution, uh, pH and B based solutions, uh, chloride based solution. It's very effective. And there is a sorbact, which I uh, like to incorporate in my clinical environment. There is a studies, clinical and microbiology studies showing that it's an effective uh, 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 alternative to the uh, antimicrobial and using the physical mode of action can still reduce the by burden and help us in fighting death rate, which is going to be immense and economical collapse. Questions? It's Bonnie here, and I've got a couple of questions to ask you from some of the folks attending tonight. Uh, the first one is, what is medicated versus non-medicated dressings? Is silver, iodine, and PHMB-based dressings considered as a medicated dressings? So, medicated versus non-medicated. If you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I was saying that there is an antimicrobial, which can be bactericidal or bacteriostatic. So when we're talking about silver and iodine, it's killing bacteria. When we're talking about uh, hydrophobic dressing, like a sorbact, it's not killing bacteria. It's binding them. It's putting them in the jail. It's putting them on the party blanket and removing them out. So unless they will stop being hydrophobic and being hydrophobic is their, is their way of being, they're not going to, they cannot change this part. Maybe, I don't know. So far, there is no resistance reported. Let's put it this way. While there is a resistance to silver reported, not white, but reported, there is some, I believe I've seen a case of resistance to iodine. And you're also allergic to iodine. You can be allergic to silver. You can be allergic to uh, different other ways. This mode of action, there was no allergy reported because it's basically textile. And you can be allergic to textile probably but the uh, allergy is less possible with this dressing. Um, Rose, just, we got a couple more minutes, maybe for a couple more questions here. Um, one qu quick one here, is, is it it's still acceptable to use 1% vinegar? Yes, when it's eating? acceptable. Remember there's antiseptic, they can be toxic to the cells, but they can also, also be uh, toxic to the, uh, to the patients. So vinegar, as we know, we're using it for the cytomonas and with actually with Debraclin, you can use any solution you want. Okay. And then a question here, when do we use, uh, she, the person's listed three products, Iodazorb, Iodine, and Bactagrass? Uh, 
I think it depends on the wound. You need to look at the dime, debridement, infection, moisture, and edge effect. And when you assess your wound, you decide what you use. Do you need antimicrobial? Iodine is a quick action binding to the proteins. Iodazorb is a slow release product. So there is a wound canada I actually have a beautiful uh, um, picker, which dressing to use when there is a lot of, you can mail me and I can send you a couple of articles talking about when to use what, but I think I need another hour to explain. I have presentation, if you have it, I can, I can pull it out and go over it. Now, another thing nobody asks, but I want to tell that when you use the sore buck, I, uh, it's very important. Um, you don't need to combine it with anything else because it's antimicrobial, but not acidic. It's not killing, static, and it uses the hydropubicity, so it should be moist environment. Um, one last question here. My hospital has an antimicrobial stewardship program in place, but it does not address overuse in antimicrobial dressings and wounds. Is it a common practice? So wounds, as we know, this is why you're going to be there. And this is why it's multidisciplinary team. There are a couple of the nice document how incorporate antimicrobial stewardship into the wound. And they're also available in the presentation and the references, easy to download. So I think you should go to your committee and say, listen, we need to look at this as well. So we don't put silver on every wound or we don't put iodosorb on every wound or we don't put whatever is AM, PHMB dressing or AMD gas, whatever is your practice, whatever is your wound uh, toolbox, definitely when you have a diabetic ulcer with a susceptible, susceptible uh, individual and you need an antimicrobial therapy, yes, go for it. But when the wound is healing, maybe second guess it and maybe you clean it very nice when it's antimicrobial but you don't put an antimicrobial dressing and antiseptics and antimicrobial used interchangeably because you remember antimicrobial is a big umbrella and antiseptic is one of them in the beginning of your presentation you commented that 80 percent of wounds have biofilm i was wondering if you were aware of the percentage of biofilm affected wounds is higher in diabetic population i'm not aware of any paper uh, quantifying so this is anti-infectives you remember there is a lot of different uh, of them i'm not aware of any paper uh, quantifying amount of antimicrobial of, of uh, biofilms. Maybe there are, I'm just not aware of it. Okay. And also the biofilm amount is very different. There are papers which say 60%, 70%, 20%. It depends on acute wound. And so I don't have an answer. Sorry. Okay. Well, it's probably more because the host is more susceptible and has less uh, defenses. Well, thanks, Rose. As always, it was an, an amazing presentation. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. For, uh, it was very engaging and the poll questions to get everybody engaged just added that little bit extra as well. Thank you to everybody for attending the webinar tonight. If you have any further questions, please contact us by email or contact Wounds Canada at info at woundscanada.ca. Once you leave today's webinar, you will be immediately receiving our survey on this presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you would complete it to provide your feedback. If you will receive also a follow-up email within a week with a link to view the recordings of today's webinar for Wounds Canada. On behalf of Rose, Essity, and Wounds Canada, thank you so much for joining us all tonight, and have a wonderful evening.